Richard Steiger. Good evening. Thank you for coming in. You're very welcome, honorable chair, members of the board, and guests. My name is Richard Steiger. My wife and I are retired. We are rent stabilized tenants, and we pay more than 50% of our income for rent. My wife has several serious medical conditions necessitating that she take eight different prescription drugs. It is a struggle, but we are far from alone. About 30% of tenants pay more than 50% of their income for rent. Indeed, more than half of all New Yorkers pay over 30% of their income in rent, meaning they are considered rent burdened under federal guidelines. We have record homelessness in New York City. Almost 60,000 people are sleeping in shelters every night. There are 33,000 public school students living in homeless shelters, according to the city's independent budget office. To give some perspective to that figure, 33,000 homeless students is tantamount to filling Madison Square Garden twice for two hockey games. That is unconscionable. I believe there are two academics on the board. This should outrage you, knowing the deleterious effect a student's living circumstances could have on their learning capacity. Your proposed rent increases will lead to more homelessness, more evictions, more students sleeping in shelters, and bear in mind, landlords are earning 42 cents on the dollar and we've lost more than 200,000 rent-stabilized apartments. The philosopher Kierkegaard once said, to dare is to lose one's footing momentarily. Not to dare is to lose oneself. I ask this board to dare. Institute a rent freeze on one and two year leases, like Nassau and Rockland counties did. Help stem the rising tide of homelessness. Help keep vulnerable New Yorkers, particularly students and my wife and I, in our homes. Your task is difficult, but it must be made difficult, for only the difficult inspires the noble-hearted. I'm asking this board to be noble-hearted and kind. Dare to do the right thing and freeze the rents. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Borough President, Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Good Thank evening, you, Larry, and Ann Cunningham is still here. So I'm Gail Brewer, I'm the Manhattan Borough President. I want to thank Chair Roberts and all the members of the board. I know this is not an easy task. I thank the board for rent increases and a minimal increase over the past three years, and I again urge you to consider the full impact of even a small increase as well as the continued loss of affordable and regulated housing. I know you know that, but it's really a crisis. It's my understanding that this board held a preliminary vote in which you decided to increase rents between 0.75% and 2.75% yeah, and for one year lease and 1.75% and 3.75% for two year as you know. These proposed increases fall below what the owners and their representatives are demanding. They would exasperate the inequality, the years of high increases throughout the 2000s. That those times benefit the owners to the detriment of tenants. PIOC data calculated by the Rent Guidelines Board and your wonderful staff indicate that operating costs have risen slightly. If this information is considered in isolation, then your proposed increases would make sense. However, the cumulative impact of past increases over the years cannot be isolated from other factors that continue to drive up housing costs, nor should the cumulative benefits that owners have received be dismissed in favor of one year small rise in operating costs. The purpose of the board and the law, the rent stabilization law, is to balance the competing interests of owners and tenants with the goal of helping to preserve affordable housing in the face of the market forces of New York real estate. It's an international and speculative market, as you know, is unlike any housing market elsewhere. No matter the circumstances of the market, 
The average working New Yorker needs a place to live to raise his or her family and call home. It's the board's duty, in my opinion, to ensure that tenants' voices are heard, as you are doing today, and to prevent them from becoming pawns of New York's rising market. The last three guideline orders issued by this board, 46, 47, 48, were partly a result of the understanding that by the board that not only had operational costs gone down, but owners have been grossly overcompensated by guidelines increases over the previous two decades. Even with stabilization, rents were rising beyond the ability of many working families to pay, resulting in loss of homes, doubling up, all the things regarding homelessness that you know. We had hoped that the zero, zero, and one percent increases for one-year lease renewals in the last three orders would have slowed down the skyrocketing of stabilized rent. Hasn't happened. We know that the rent freezes and low increases did not, in fact, stop the rise in stabilized rents. We're losing affordable housing. The 2017 Housing and Vacancy Survey reports that the median rent for post-war stabilized units increased 4.5% since 2014. Continued rent increases heavily impact, as you know, the poor households and the working households in our city. 2016 data compiled by the Furman Center show that in Manhattan, nearly one quarter of all rental households are severely rent burdened, as you heard from the previous speaker, 50% or more toward rent of their income. In Manhattan, nearly 45% of low income households are rent burdened in 2016. Increases continue to result in people losing their homes. According to the board's own report in New York City housing stock in 2017 alone, the city lost 3,517 apartments to high rent vacancy deregulation, 26% more than in 2016. We know this is Albany's problem, but we, since they may not do anything, we need to adjust for that. How is this happening in light of the board's recent rent freezes and 1% increase and why is it important that the board take these facts into consideration? It is a responsibility, I think, of this board to balance the various factors impacting rents and the stability of housing in our city. It is clear to all of us who work in housing and who care about our neighborhoods and affordable housing and cutting homelessness that parts of the rent stabilization law and the system as it is used by owners have enormous impact on rising rents and the loss of the affordables. Rents are being pushed higher and higher by MCIs, often one MCI in one building. This is important information for the board to consider. The minor increase in alleged owner expenses should be tempered by the knowledge that even when these increases given by this board were small or zero, rents increased. Take this into consideration. We have many examples regarding the MCI, which is relevant. This year, our staff met with Mr. G, a long-term tenant from the Upper West Side, of course. When he first saw a 166 hike in his rent per month, he didn't believe it was possible. He's a rent-stabilized tenant, he said, so his rent could not have gone up so steeply in one year. But the next rent bill and the next, and he could see that it was true, but he ignored what he viewed as illegal charges and he accumulated over 20,000 in rental arrears. He's now contesting the MCI with DHCR, but it's not something that he can pay. Mr. G lives in a 20-store building with 140 units. We know that over 20,000 has been charged to his unit alone for one MCI over the past years. Multiply this across 140 units over the same time, and we can estimate that the owner netted return for a one-time capital improvement at over $2.5 million. This board understands fully that landlords apply legally your annual rent determinations on top of MCI increases that have been incorporated into base rents. It is imperative that MCIs are acknowledged as the veiled extra rental income that they are, long after the capital improvement has been repaid, as we know. 
When rent increases, outpays wage and salary increases, tenants who can no longer afford their rent end up losing their apartments. Unlikely to find another stabilized apartment and unable to afford a market rate, these tenants have few options. They double up, they triple up, and they don't cover their medical expenses, or worse, they move out of New York, or worse, they become homeless. Ms. S. also sought help from my office. Her landlord, she felt, was illegally increasing her rent. And looking through her documents, we could see that there was a triple-digit rent increase due to an MCI. She chose to stay where she was living because she didn't know where else she was going to go. No other stabilized apartment. But she's now very, very rent burdened. The cumulative compensation, I hope I've made it clear, that this board has granted to landlords over the past two decades outpaces the calculated net operating expenses for buildings. And as I said, each MCI payment beyond, beyond the owner's recuperation of capital expenses constitutes another kind of overcompensation. Tenants are owed many more years of rent freezes in order to be made whole. So I urge you at the very least to vote for the lowest rent increase for both one and two years. Finally, I cannot mention, uh, I have to talk about the SROs because Ann Cunningham is sitting in the front row. And I thank the board for maintaining SRO rents at the level of zero increase for another year which extends protection to this particularly vulnerable population and, and, and less and less of them are still alive of rent-stabilized tenants. And I ask that each of the board's determinations also reflect the full impact of the multiplier effect by which even small percentage increases contribute to deep reductions in housing affordability. And thank you very much for giving me this time. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Janice Hamilton, Charles Anderson, and Carol Lazio. Good evening. Thank you for coming in. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, just you need to keep your head close to the microphone. Like that? Is that better? Yes. Okay. So, you know, it's impossible for you know, for the, the rents to be kept the same indefinitely. That's literally impossible because the city, um, the tax department, the water department, and all those places, over a period of 15 years, 10 years, it goes up. All right? So, you, you know, you have to pay a dollar more for rent over time. The Rent Guidelines Board froze the rents for the last two or three years prior to this last thing. Okay? It was frozen for two years. All right, historically, in, t in 2000 and something, between 12 and 15 or whatever it was. Okay, we, 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 the city needs to implement, just like you have SCRI, S -C -R -I -E, and other programs for people that are disabled and low income, provide a subsidy for them to apply to so a landlord can get the subsidy that goes along with their income. They have to find a way they, pro they stopped the Section 8, the, the federal government, a few years ago. Um, they don't issue new vouchers anymore. It's a problem. So I think they need to, to work with coming up with a new program that would subsidize low-income affordable tenants and disabled. So if you can only pay $1,200 but the rent is $1,500, you apply for a program and you get subsidized in some form through another program. Senior citizens have SCREE. You also have, you know, and they have STAR, Enhanced STAR if they're homeowners, and you have uh, other things if you're renters for SCREE. However, they need another kind of program with all of this going on. It's impossible to keep the rent the same for 20 years and ask the Rent Guidelines Board to keep 0% rent increases forever. They did it for two years. We want to do it forever. That's what people are asking. You have operating costs that you know, I mean, it's, you don't control the government. You don't control the city of New York, and they're not gonna lower the, the, the tax rate, the water rates, and whatever else for one person or for a certain group. It's, it's all across the border. This is the rates for one and two families. This is the rate for multifamily, whatever. And that's how they, de they determine to tax you on, the water people and all these people. So you don't control them. You can fight city hall because your tenants, whatever, having problems. 
it's not going to all Excuse the fighting me, is not going to make a change. Excuse me, your time is up. Could you wrap up your testimony? I'm sorry. I said your time is up. Could you wrap up your testimony? Yeah, and and that's basically my my my, my statement. It's impossible to keep the rents the same and, and be at zero forever for Thank the next you. 20 years. Thank you. Charles Anderson. Hi. Good, Good evening. evening. Thank you for coming in. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll be reading testimony on behalf of Assemblymember Deborah Glick. I'm who, sorry, I can't hear you. You can't hear me. All right. Uh, I will be reading testimony on behalf of Assemblymember Glick. Uh, who is currently in Albany uh, right now finishing up the legislative session. I will yell, uh, I thank the board for the unprecedented rent freeze instituted in 2015 and 2016 and for the modest increases seen last year. However, I urge you to again implement a rent freeze for all rent regulated leases this year, despite the suggested increase of 0.75 to 2.75% for one year lease renewals and 1.75 to 3.75% for two year lease renewals, New Yorkers are still catching up from a long history of rent increases, including last year's increase and deserve a year of a rent freeze. It is clear that New York City is experiencing a widespread housing crisis amidst a prolific boom in construction across our city. While some may argue that efforts by the mayor to create affordable housing will bridge the gaps in affordability, everyday New Yorkers continue to struggle to find and maintain affordable housing. Constituents regularly reach out to our office to express concern and frustration over rising rents and harassment from landlords who are challenging their residency and illegally trying to terminate leases. Even with the mayor's initiatives, there simply aren't enough affordable housing units to meet a growing demand. We continue to lose rent stabilized units due to harassment and deregulation. However, rent increases force tenants out of communities and thus exacerbate the problem of illegal deregulation. According to NYU's Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy, between 2006 and 2016, while there were increases in median income, the number of rent burdened New Yorkers across all lower and middle and moderate income levels rose. The Furman Center also reported that on average in 2016, there were fewer affordable apartments for low to moderate income New Yorkers than in 2006. Our population is aging and increasingly dependent on fixed incomes, while apartments that encourage, apartments that encourage long-term affordability are disappearing. The neighborhoods that I represent are among the most expensive in the United States and have likely experienced an even greater increase in median gross rent and loss of affordable units. The cost of real estate makes it nearly impossible for, uh, to construct affordable housing within these expensive zip codes, and little or affordable housing that is built in my district requires incentives and outright cajoling by city and state governments, as otherwise, otherwise developers will not build housing for lower middle income New Yorkers. Furthermore, landlords continue to make use of the MCI system. That are frequently ba these are frequently basic updates to building-wide services and should be extended to tenants regardless of rent. I would like to thank the Rent and Guidelines Board for the progress made during the rent freezes of 2015 and 16 and urge a rent freeze for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Lazio. Good evening. Thank you for coming in. I'm a 78-year-old low-income senior eligible for food stamps and extra help with Medicare-related expenses. Since 1986, I have been living in a seven and a half by 10 foot hotel stabilized room with a bathroom in the hall on the top floor of a mixed use apartment building, which originally had 11 rooms and 33 apartments. When I moved in, the agent who handled my rental intimated that I might eventually be able to transfer to a, an apartment when one became available. In 1988, in accordance with a plan filed in 1992, when the current landlord took over the building, vacated rooms on the other side of my floor were altered to form a penthouse. Meanwhile, thanks to an aggressive combination of evictions, flimsy renovations, and vacancy increases, most one-bedroom apartments on the floors below me that were renting for $500 a month in 1986 now rent for over $3,500. And two-bedroom apartments that rented for $800 a month in 1992 now rent for over $4,000. In April 2016, I became the last hotel-stabilized SRO tenant in the building and the last tenant on my half of the floor. In all these years, the size of 
The size of my room hasn't changed, and my bathroom is still in the hall. So I'm very grateful to the Rent Guidelines Board for the position it has taken to maintain costs for tenants in situations like mine. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Robert Conkling, Richard Barr, and Jessica Burke. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for, uh, for listening. Um, my name is Robert Conkling, and I'm a rent-stabilized SRO tenant at 215 West 14th Street. And um, I'm also a member of the Tenant Association in that building and I've lived in my apartment for 30 years. And really my message tonight is to thank you and to, uh, and to thank the uh, owner members for at least listening to, to us. I could tell you the story of um, three different landlords and continuous harassment over these 30 years that has eventually led us to um, the last several years being in court eight separate times that has brought us to a 7A um, fight that we're involved in right now. And I could talk to you about um, the ongoing un, uh, un, uh, uh, construction of, uh, as harassment techniques that are being used by our landlord. I could talk to you about all the um, uh, eviction proceedings against innocent tenants in our building that have actually been overturned, but have cost a lot of time and grief for these tenants, my fellow tenants. Um, and I could, I, I could talk to you about the, um, the beauty of a form of life that, and a form of uh, apartment living in New York that is fast, fast diminishing and disappearing, um, but that we still call home. We recognize that our landlords um, are the owners of our buildings, but these are our homes, and we are fighting for them. And so I guess my, my point is to simply say thank you for the years that you have voted for a zero percent increase and for proposing the same this year. We truly appreciate it. And uh, as we continue to find ways to fight for this housing stock in New York. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Richard Barr. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Richard Barr. I'm a rent stabilized tenant in Manhattan. I've been also at other times a rent control tenant. Uh, I've attended these hearings many times over the years and one familiar pattern always occurs which is the property owners who come own 10 units or eight or five or three. They're struggling to make ends meet as they describe it and ought to have their needs and whether they require the assistance of rent increases to be taken into account on their own as they are. Who we don't hear from are the people who own 200 units or 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 or more, many of which units as a result of vacancy decontrol, thanks to good old New York State, have gone to market rates which could be three or five or even 10 times what the rent would have been if the unit had remained regulated. Those people don't need your 2% or your 3% or your 5%, no way. And they should be considered separately from the people who come here, small owners who tell you they're struggling. I've been saying this for years. One size doesn't fit all or one size shouldn't fit all and the technology exists to individualize this and look at the small owner versus the big owner and see who does and doesn't need anything from you. So um, that's my main point. Since my time is running out, I would just like to point out that you regulate uh, rent stabilized increases, the state does rent control and, and hits them with 7.5% each year. I wish the Rent Guidelines Board would join others in saying to the state, we would like to have rent controlled increases brought before the Rent Guidelines Board instead of DHCR, bring it, bring it home so it could be fairer as, as this has become fairer. And ho I hopefully 
you would also advocate for uh, repeal of the Erstat law so that New York City could gain full control over its tenant protection laws. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jessica Burke. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Thanks for coming in. Um, first of all, I'd like to let in, anyone who's interested know that on Facebook, my page is entitled, Why is my landlord not in jail? I urge anyone to contact me with information specifically relating to that. Some of you also may have seen us in the paper recently. Um, sadly, I lost my mom, who would have been 95 in August. She passed away recently. She spent her entire life fighting for her two-bedroom rent-controlled apartment on Christopher Street, where I now live. You may have read about us in the paper. The landlord was forced to give us a half a million dollars after years of harassing us. Um, and I agreed to leave at the end of the year. Unfortunately, I'm shocked and horrified that people keep coming up to me left and right both in my building and in my neighborhood begging me to help them because the landlords are trying to throw them out of their rent stabilized apartments. Specifically, uh, Dree and Scree apartment holders. Uh, when the landlord doesn't get what they want, they engage in a criminal activity wherein they call anonymously Adult Protective Services and one by one these elderly people who have no one to defend or support them are dragged out of their apartments and placed against their will in a nursing home and imprisoned there where the landlords can get their apartments. That was done to my mom, who at gunpoint was removed from our apartment, placed in DeWitt nursing home. And if not for Arthur Schwartz, our district leader, who rescued her and placed her back in her apartment, I wouldn't have half a million dollars today. I urge everyone to continue to come to these hearings and it's ridiculous to keep granting rent increases to landlords. I remind the board and everyone else, being a landlord isn't the same thing as being a fireman. It isn't a heroic thing. We don't need to support them. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next three speakers are Federico Flores, Gregory Morrow, and Stephen Williams. Uh, Good evening. Doing? Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is my first time, so I don't have any uh, testimony in front of me. Just a little bit about my situation. Um, Could you speak I, a little closer to the microphone? Okay. A little Thank bit about you. my situation. I uh, live in uh, Savoy Park, which is based, which is located 142nd and Lenox Avenue. I've been there for about four years, rent stabilized. I, uh, I work for uh, Con Edison, and I pay $2,400 a month on time, all the time. Uh, I do... A, I understand both sides. I do one day want to be an owner myself, but um, we, we have to have a balance because as far as maintenance goes, I know the essentials from the, from the bottom up. And with these big management, you know, if they don't, if they don't you know, if they don't, hope, uh, if they don't take care of their maintenance part of the situation, they should be held accountable. They should be penalized. Uh, because I hold my end of, of the agreement on the contract, so I think they should do, do the same. And there should be a, you know, a, a oversight committee to see that, to see that you know, maybe there should be a, a penalty for that. And you know, f as far as the, you know, uh, the, uh, the small homeowners, own, the own ho homeowners, they, uh, they should get like a tax rebate you know, if they maintain their, their, uh, their buildings and, and, and do, do good by the tenant. They should get some kind of reward for that. But for the big management, they should, you know, at least get penalized, held accountable for that. Because, you know, I hold up my end of the bargain, they should hold them theirs. At the end of the day, I provide an essential uh, thing for the city, so I respect the same in return. But if they don't do that, I mean, what's, what, what's going to happen? You know, it's going to be the same old thing. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you. <laughs> Gregory Morrow. Good evening, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. A wise man once said, recognize it, you energize it. So I came here to thank this body. I know that, uh, that Larry Wood, 
presented you with data regarding the tenants he represents at the Goddard Riverside Law Project. And because of the decision that you made, I'm not going to have to move. I'll be able to stay in my home of 23 years. Although I do pay over a third of my rent, a third of my income in rent, again, I don't, uh, I'm happy to say that I'm not going to have to move in the immediate future. And for that, I thank this body very much. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. <laughs> Stephen Williams. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, yes. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming Lord, in. Thank you. This is my second hearing. I have more questions than answers. I'll be very brief. Um, I'm still figuring out the process, how this goes. As I understand okay. it, your mandate is... You're going to need to speak more okay. closely to the microphone, please. As I understand, your mandate is to protect tenants from any upward rent increases resulting from the housing shortage, guarantee landlords a fair and equitable return, and, sorry, and um, protect and promote New York City's overall housing stock. Is that correct? Anybody heard me? Okay. I live in a rent-stabilized building. There are four empty units. 80,000 people, homeless. I don't know how you do your math, but um, I would appreciate it if you could put your process online so that I can figure it out. And I'm running out of time here. I had to come here today to ask questions because it's very difficult to figure out the process. Um, but paint is really expensive, apparently, in New York City. Wage inflation for rent-stabilized landlords that employ union and non-union painters is off the charts. It's twice as high as it is across the country. Um, I have 42 seconds. Have you ever conducted an audit? May I ask that question? Is that permissible? That, or? That's not our responsibility. It's not your responsibility? Okay. It's not the responsibility of the Rent Guidelines Board, no. Okay, so the, um, so the data that is reviewed is voluntary um, and has never been audited, is that correct? Or I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be hard, I'm not trying to figure this whole thing out. Don't hate me next year. That's really <laughs> a question for the Department of Finance. Okay. Um, as I understand it, you don't, none of you um, take it up fairly. Yeah. All right, thank you. The next three speakers are Lena Melendez, Caroline Wexelbaum, and Jesse Townsend. Lena Melendez. Not here, all right. Um, Caroline Wexelbaum. Hi. Good evening, Hi. thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. I will be delivering testimony on behalf of State Senator Brad Hoyleman. Um, thank you, Chair Roberts and members of the Rent Guidelines Board for the opportunity to submit testimony tonight. I represent New York State's 27th District. This mixed income district is composed largely of tenants, thousands of them rent regulated, both in small buildings and iconic rental complexes, including Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village, London Terrace Gardens, West Beth, and Phipps Plaza. As such, these proposed rent guidelines are crucial to my district and, I believe, New York City as a whole. After the board's decision to increase rents last year, a rent freeze would offer a necessary respite from the constant financial anxiety experienced by hardworking New Yorkers. As you know, many advocates are pushing for a rent freeze or even a rollback this year. I join them in this request, not only because the data supports our position, but because New York City is deep into an existential affordability crisis and it is the proper role of government to be a bulwark against homelessness, displacement, and further economic segregation. Given this reality, I was disappointed and frustrated to learn that the RGB has suggested rent increases ranging from 0.75% to 2.75% for one-year leases 
and 1.75% to 3.75% for two-year leases for rent-stabilized apartments. As you know, the RGB's mission is to create price points that would be present if New York City's rental market were operating under fair free market conditions. A vacancy rate of 5% is considered the line of demarcation for a properly operating rent uh, market, and the current vacancy rate of 3.63% must be considered a sign of dangerous instability requiring the steadying hand of government. A lot has been written about how the data uh, justifies a rent increase because the price index of operating costs increased by 4.5 percent over the last year. This single data point only justifies a rent increase if one ignores the rest of the data made available by the RGB's excellent research staff. Those numbers tell us, for instance, that for the 12th straight year, net operating income grew by 4.4 percent this year. If costs are going up by 4.5 percent and you're still making a net profit of 4.4 percent, and you do not need to be saved by government. Excuse me, your, your time is up. Could you okay. wind up your testimony, please? Uh, I'm sorry? Could you wind up your testimony? Absolutely. You can submit it as well. Absolutely, it's, it's submitted. Um, real estate ownership, including ownership of rent-regulated properties, will always be a high-growth industry in New York. But the supply of the citizens who gave New York its character is not similarly guaranteed. We need artists and iron workers living alongside lawyers and doctors for our city to retain its fundamental ethos. And this is simply not possible if we fear a slightly smaller paycheck for landlords more than we fear homelessness and segregation. I understand that the preliminary vote has already set the range for increases, and I dispute the assertion that those ranges are binding. It does not say so in the statute. Therefore, I am appealing to, uh, appealing to the nine of you who care about New York City enough to spend your time on a project as thankless as this to do the right thing and not institute a rent increase. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Thank you. Thank you. Jesse Townsend. Hello. Can you hear me? Not quite. How's that? Much there better. We go. Thank you, Chair Roberts, and to the members of the board for having me today. I'm here to read on behalf of Council Member Ben Kalos. Uh, this is the first hearing that he hasn't been able to come to in person in the past several years, but he's at home on paternity leave with his newborn daughter, so I'm uh, here on his behalf. I will give you the uh, two-minute version, and we've submitted full testimony Thank on the you. record. Um, so to, to the New Yorkers here today, and especially tenants, thank you for attending this hearing. I am proud to stand with you today. This year, I am calling on the Rent Guidelines Board to vote for a rent freeze. After two straight years of historic rent freezes, last year, the board voted for a rent increase of 1.25% for one-year leases and 2% for two-year leases. While a lower increase than the disproportionately high increases of previous years under prior administrations, more still needs to be done to balance tenants' rent burdens with landlords' revenues. Year after year, as rents go up, tenants have shouldered an undue burden. Meanwhile, income cannot keep pace and has only crept up by 2.3%. That was between 2005 and 2013 in real terms before this board started to lower the increases. The approved rent increases each year were largely based upon the landlord's operating costs measured by the price index of operating costs, the PIOC. This practice not only failed to consider tenants, but was also proven to be inaccurate. Based upon data from the Department of Finance, the PIOC has overstated landlord costs by 11% since 2005. This miscalculation led to, fit to unfairly high rent increases in past years, which must be corrected with a rent freeze. Over the past four years, the board has done a lot of work to fix this and to improve this process, and we thank you for that, both by adapting the way it evaluates the data and by expanding its public hearings to reach more tenants and landlords in more parts of the city. In 2016, the board instituted a second hearing in northern Manhattan and has kept up that level of accessibility since then. We thank the board members for those changes. In establishing rent adjustments this year, we must acknowledge that even after these fixes, after the freezes and the low increases of the past four years, rent guidelines board increases have still far outpaced inflation and the consumer price index. I have compared 23 years of rent guidelines board increases to the CPI and found that the rent increases outpaced the CPI by over 10%. That means a $500 a month apartment in 1994 
is now a minimum of $926, whereas following inflation, it would have been $830. We use this as an example to show that these increases, still despite the recent fixes, have outpaced um, the wage, wage increases that tenants have seen. So we ask you to balance the tenants' burdens with landlord revenues when considering voting for a rent freeze this year. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Lupe Hernandez, Henry Dombrowski, and Judith Frank. Good evening. Thank you for coming in. Good evening. Thank you uh, for having us. Um, I'm here on behalf of uh, the tenants at Independent Plaza. We uh, were one of those buildings that actually uh, our landlord bought and exited the Mitchell Lama program. We lost the J51 abatement. They were collecting the abatement, although they had increased our rent. And even though we lost on that, we lost on, we had actually won. And at the Supreme Court, based on a bill that never went into legislation, it allowed our landlord and the management, the owner of the building, to maintain his increase and deregulate our apartments. My husband grew up in Independence Plaza, and we have been struggling with keeping up with the rent increases, especially back in the our late 2000s. And we've been taken to court several times Although my husband's father was the super of our building, they tried to act like they didn't know who we were. And um, we have spent the past five years that my son has been born, who is on the spectrum, who is uh, developmentally delayed, had to deal with the stress of litigation, fighting both civil and housing, from trying to be evicted to uh, illegal electrician charges and late fees. And through all those um, increases, they failed to even renew our lease when they finally gave it to us when you guys did actually grant that rent freeze. Somehow they managed to put two years on the lease when they offered it to us. So we never even got a chance to take advantage of that rent freeze. On top of which, because we are lab tenants, there's always going to be a 1% increase on top of whatever it is that you guys decide. Let me also stress the fact that our building is mixed now with some newer tenants, so they do want to get us out so they can renovate and increase the rent. Meanwhile, our apartments have not received any um, you know, upgrades or even just main maintaining. We were one of the tenants that lead was found in our apartment, only after which we were flooded and the city had to get involved and found the lead was tested positive. Please take for to be able to raise my son in the same neighborhood that his father grew up with I please beg you for to just consider another rent freeze thank you thank you Henry Dombrowski good afternoon RGB tenants landlords thank you for having me thank you for coming in thank you um, I'd like to point out the massive housing crisis statistics. Uh, these, uh, these, these present something very destructive uh, that's going on. Uh, I asked a question to any landlord business owner after buying one building and finding out that it's not really lucrative or it's a lot of work, why in the world would you then go out and buy a, another one or three or four or five? The reason one leads to five and more is because of the massive profits being made due to the regular occurrence of tenants paying half their, rent, half their income in rents. Current profits are so massive that rental housing purchases have captured the attention of private equity firms that have been buying up hundreds of these buildings as a business plan. Wall Street does not need a raise. Private equity purchases have brought with it the most violent degree of criminal tenant harassment we have seen to force tenants from their stabilized apartments. And it's working. Um, 
once again take a look at uh, the housing crisis the massive homelessness increase uh, Uh, read the Times and today's uh, article in Harper's and get a sense of what's going on. It's everywhere in news stories. I just asked the rent, uh, the, the rent guidelines board, the rent guidelines board to vote for a rent freeze. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Judith Frank. Good evening. Thank Hi. you for coming in. Thank you. Um, my name is Judith Frank. I'm. Um, I do. My son does real estate, rental real estate in the city, and he's astonished by how many apartments, like um, studio apartments, are transformed into one bedrooms at a high rate. They don't even get a real refrigerator. They get mini fridges, and they're demanding like over two thousand dollars for these spaces. I want to call attention to Huffington Post, which quoted the um, Harvard study out today that, um, which one is it exactly? The title is um, from the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard University. The report compiles hundreds of metrics on the health of America's housing sector and finds that despite some short-term progress since the reception, recession, the long-term prognosis is grim. Low-cost housing is disappearing from the market, and this is, um, they cite the fact that um, expensive housing encourages, like the gentleman said, private equity firms and other investors to buy up apartment buildings and evict the current residents. Not only that, it gets, it finds out that it gets worse. The study found that the fastest rise in home prices at the low end of the market and low-cost housing has disappeared from the market. Since 1990, more than 2.5 million apartments renting for less than $800 per month have been demolished, upgraded into luxury condos or converted into hotels or offices. Between 2010 and 2017, prices in poor urban neighborhoods rose 50% faster than in rich neighborhoods, forcing residents to choose between spending an ever-increasing share of their income on rent or moving away. And just, there's just not enough housing low cost. So I'm asking you, as it goes further, that American cities are unaffordable. As we know, New York is becoming unaffordable. Lots more homeless people on the street. So I'm asking you to please not to make the uh, rental increase this year. We've had enough and people and salaries are just not going up to meet the uh, demands. Thank you. Thank you. The next three speakers are Christopher Athenaos, Lena Melendez, and Ann Moss. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Christopher Athenaos. I'm a small property owner from Brooklyn. Uh, my family and I own and operate nine buildings with about 150 apartments. Uh, we do much of the work ourselves and take pride in maintaining our buildings as best we can. We have an excellent relationship with our tenants and I believe uh, they appreciate the service we provide. I've testified at these hearings since junior high school, believe it or not, when my grandmother used to take me to one police plaza. We've never been in a worse environment than we are now. I receive no help or respect from the government in maintaining my building. New laws are passed each year, such as lead paint, asbestos, facades, elevators, oil tanks, boilers, fire safety, handicap accessibility, just to name a few. Yet all, with all of these new mandates, the, the board, the mayor, and the city council never come up with a way to pay for this. The PIOC is totally ignored. When it's very low, the board pointed to it uh, to justify a 0% increase. When it was high, the board pointed to tenant affordability to justify a 1% increase. And so the dance goes. Yet the board, is in recent memory, failed to even acknowledge these new mandates every year. They point to the board's studies of rising uh, net operating income as some measure of profit, 
Yet any reasonable person can tell you that it's not profit. That money needs to be spent on all of these necessary maintenance items. When the NOI is not enough to cover these actual costs, the work doesn't get done and the quality of housing suffers. When this happens year after year, decade after decade, you start to reach the point of no return. It doesn't matter because that by that time, this board is gone, the mayor is gone, and the owner and the tenants are left to pick up the pieces. NYSHA is the perfect example. NYSHA is blamed for the terrible conditions of leaks, no heat, mold, and lead paint, yet they are given no funds to properly fix these items. It doesn't matter because no one's responsible. The buck is passed from one administration to another, and so the dance goes. That's exactly what this board does. They listen to the tenants complain of the horrific conditions, and they continue to pass low guidelines as if that will help to improve the quality of housing. I can go on and on, but in the end, it comes back to this board, the nine people who sit behind the table who decide the fate of housing. I urge you to consider a reasonable increase to match the rising costs of maintaining my buildings. If you choose to pass a zero or a 1% increase, I ask that you realize that you're just continuing the NYSHA model for killing the housing stock little by little, year after year, that will ultimately hurt the constituents you're supposed to serve, both owners and the tenants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lena Melendez. Hi, my name's Lena Melendez. Good I'm evening. from Washington Heights. I'm not a wealthy uh, Hampton vacation homeowner, nor uh, have I traveled the world. I need a rent rollback, though. Rent guideline board increases are not the only way a landlord can increase rents. Mixed-use buildings can pass tax increases along to commercial tenants. MCIs, 20% vacancy increase. Rent control departments go up 7.5% a year. Late fees, tax abatements. Let's not forget landlords illegally deregulate apartments by splitting them, no work permits, only one mode of egress, and getting market rate rents for them. And by putting in for rent increases without ever producing a single receipt for the renovations. We need a rent rollback. There are folks that are so rent burdened that the, any kind of increase can send them over a financial precipice. We need a rent rollback. Politicians. Cash, corruption, collusion. Politicians are colluding with Rebney and landlord lobbyists. When people get harassed by landlords, the politicians and the city agencies either go far, don't go far enough or turn a blind eye altogether. We need more transparency. We need to stop landlords from hiding behind LLCs, and we, have to, we need to get them to open up their books to see exactly how much they're raking in. Um, it's greater than 40% return on their investment, I can tell you that. We need a rent rollback. Families are doubling up. In many cases, young folks are tripling up just to be able to afford the rent. People are suffering. People on fixed incomes like the disabled and the elderly. We need a rent rollback. The people that have testified in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan are not lying. We're poor. We're not lazy. I work 10 hours a week, six, 10 hours a day, six to seven times a week. I'm not a criminal. I'm not an, I'm not, I'm not an animal as our current administration would have me uh, have you believe. We need a rent rollback. In 1974, there were more than 1 million rent-stabilized apartments. 2018, there are 27,000. Re rezonings have decimated rent-stabilized apartments and increased the number of market rate rents. In Inwood, the rezonings add over 14,000, 80% market rate, an effective mode to ethnically cleanse the area. Small rent stabilized building owners are selling their properties at huge profits. We need a rent rollback. We need to punish the criminal landlords like Tishman Spire for illegally deregulating thousands of rent stabilized apartments in Stytown and Peter Cooper Village in a scheme to steal millions from more than 27 Excuse tenants. Excuse me, your time is up. You need to wrap up your testimony, please. Okay, thank you. To turn apartments into high priced condos, despite raking in millions with J51 tax abatements to provide affordable housing and later default on their loans. Don't reward these thugs. We need a rent rollback. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Moss. Yeah. Is Ann Moss here? No. Okay. We're going to take three more people and then we'll be taking a break. Um, the next three speakers are Nikki Ledger, Diane Stein, and Geraldine Scalia. Good evening. Thank you for coming in. Hi, I'm one of the
the tenant leaders of Cooper Square Committee? The most recent issue of the nation reports that in 2017, the real estate industry spent $10 million in lobbying New York State, quote, making it the biggest spender in the state, unquote. Frankly, landlords growing hardship is not only laughable, it is obscene. Private equity landlords have replaced the old small time owner and all boroughs who find corporations reaping profits with malice and very, very often illegally. I will identify two of possible several categories below. MCI increases with the connivance of DHCR being used to override the Squeedree laws, thereby unfreezing legally frozen rents. Consequently, the vulnerable are most unconscionably squeezed. Landlords might complain of rising costs, but can get an MCI increase for the following year, defeating the purpose of Squeed. Landlords are gaming the system. Private equity landlords are skirting the system, making money off of illegal hotels, the current version of the flop house. In January, the Daily News reported that the city sued a Chelsea building owner for running an illegal hotel. I applaud Corey Johnson's introduction of legislation. However, we need social housing, European style, not a proliferation of flop houses. We need government to act to fulfill its duty to the citizenry. The social contract and rule of law are in need of reinvigoration. The tenants are being squeezed by a rising cost of living and wage stagnation in a way that landlords could never claim. This is why we need the lowest possible rent increases this year. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Diane Stein. Hi, thank you for having this hearing. My name is Diane Stein. I'm a tenant at Independence Plaza, a former Michelama building. And we have several hundred tenants who are stabilized her in agreement with the landlord and their rent increases are effect directly affected by what happens here at the rent guidelines board and I'm here to ask for either a rent freeze or rollback. Um, I'm, it saddens me year after year I feel like the city is losing its diversity and that the tenants who help build communities are being pushed out. I feel like we're a dying breed due to landlord greed. Um, it's become, we've become a city, I think, of the very rich and very and transient and people who don't even actually live in the buildings that the, in the units that they own. I, in year after year, um, we come and testify before the board. And I once asked a tenant advocate, you know, if it's how effective, you know, we, it is that we come and testify or go to Albany. And she said that it's that if we don't come, that people think we won't, we don't care. So I think it's important that you see us and you hear from us, and you know that that we do exist. And I thank you very much for listening to us. And I hope that you will consider a rent freeze or rollback. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Geraldine Scalia. Good evening, thank you for coming in. Hello, uh, I'm Geraldine Scalia, and I'm glad I have the opportunity to yet again plea for a rent freeze or a very minimal <laughs> increase. I live in what was completely a rent regulated building on Halston Street. I've been there 36 years um, with this newish landlord as of the last. 12 years uh, he has with every person that has moved out he has renovated apartments so we have apartments that are five thousand dollars in a walk-up with a smelly hall and then apartments like mine mine is the worst which a landlord refuses to do repairs he only does repairs when he gets a little bit of push from HPD another organization that does nothing hundreds of people doing nothing. I'm sorry if you work for HPD, but it's, it doesn't make any sense to have an apartment that has holes in the floor, holes in the wall, bathtub that's cracked in the kitchen, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the landlord is not forced to repair anything. Instead, they request that I go to court. Why should I have to go to court for a landlord to do basic maintenance of an apartment and of the public areas. 
these are just some of the reasons why landlords like mine, Mark Fischler, who is under another corporate name yet again, um, he shouldn't be allowed to collect more rent. He, you know, he has condos in Florida, properties all over the place, and then this walk-up. So I just plead with you again. A lot of people are in my place. I'm on limited income. He gets he gets more in a rent rollback tax abatement for my dree slash scree than I probably pay for rent. It doesn't make any sense. Please maintain the people who care about community and affect change and growth in New York. People like myself and Diane and other people. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a 15 minute break. We'll resume at 6.30. Thank you. Can we have the interpreter just make the announcement, please? Make the mandarin. Vamos a tener un descanso de 15 minutos y vamos a resumir con los testimonios a las seis y media. Is the Mandarin interpreter here? Thank you. Could you just announce we're taking a 15 minute break and we'll resume at 6.30? 我们现在会休息十五分钟，在六点半的时候再继续。